uh, thanks to all of you for coming along this afternoon. It's always a bit of a, an odd slot to be in the last one of the day. Uh, I shall try and keep this as mercifully short as I can, but still keep it uh, informative, hopefully informative. Um, my name's Hugh Blemings, as I guess you were seen on the earlier side. I've been working on free software for quite some time now, and um, it's been my profession since 1997. And I've actually just finished a, um, a stint with IBM, seven very enjoyable years. I'm currently quite enjoying being an unemployed bum. I commend it to you at some point. I guess what this talk's about is um, I've been fortunate enough to work with some, uh, with quite a, very, quite a bright team of very experienced uh, free and open source software hackers, kernel guys in particular, uh, with the team at Auslabs. And having done some certain amount of development work myself, at very much as a journeyman um, uh, or a beginner, uh, when I started out. I guess what I've tried to do in this talk is collect together the things I saw my, my friends and colleagues doing who that just made them that much more efficient. We're sort of fortunate that free software development's come quite a long way in terms of lowering barriers of entry to at least get started. But what I've tried to capture in this talk is things that I've, I've either done myself or more often than not observed my colleagues doing that just makes them that much more efficient. It's particularly, I guess there's a point I'm particularly keen to make, I'm certainly not claiming to be a clever person myself, but I've just happened to have worked with a number of them uh, over the years. Uh, suggestions are certainly welcome at any time. This is, I've given a, this uh, variance on this talk a couple of times now. I guess this will probably be the last time I, I do do it, but each time uh, one of the really enjoyable things about it has been suggestions I've actually had from, from the audience, so it's kind of hopefully got a little bit better as, uh, as time has gone on as a result. In terms of topics, the team um, I was working with and certain my overall background has very much been on the hardware and low level sort of side of things. So we'll talk initially about uh, some observations on how to set up hardware efficiently to allow uh, development, remote debugging, particularly if you're doing uh, bring up and those sorts of activities. Talk a bit about actually getting the kernel running. Not necessarily super, super detailed stuff, but again, just things that have um, proven to be quite, quite efficient for us in, in the past talk about building kernels, and then the random data points, even though it's only sort of the last bullet I bought there on the introduction, actually it, um, probably is about a third of the talk in total, because these are just the random hints and tips that, um, that we've come across over the time. It wouldn't be a technical talk without having a, uh, a picture. This is part of the hardware lab at, um, at my old office. Um, I realised after I committed to doing this talk that now that I'm no longer an IBM employee, I perhaps shouldn't be showing photos of IBM equipment, but anyway, we'll deal, we'll deal with that if they send the lawyers around. Our group did a lot of work on um, embedded devices, so this is obviously uh, hardware to support bringing up embedded boards, and in particular what we have that I wanted to call out on this, um, on this frame is, is obviously uh, an embedded, embedded board, in this case for uh, an IBM PowerPC 440 part, or AMCC 440 part, but you notice this all sort of brown wire, so disappearing off um, down below, basically that, that allowed us to do some some useful things hardware-wise with the board. We've got Ethernet and uh, serial ports all configured up, and a um, an in-circuit emulator. If I go back to the previous frame, the unit down the bottom uh, is a, a serial concentrator. A little bit more about that in a moment. An Ethernet switch, and then a couple of relay boards, which is where um, what, what allowed us to work on these work on this hardware efficiently, uh, remotely. So just to get a bit of a sense of who I'm dealing with, are any, how many of you in the audience are involved with sort of embedded hardware debugging or development? Two. How about people doing sort of chip level stuff of any, any kind? Exactly not. One. Good. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, so one of the first things that we strike when we're doing embed, uh, bring up, so this is getting, uh, by bring up we mean getting Linux booting on a piece of hardware or on a chip that's never run Linux before. One of the first things we strike is, of course, it's going to take a while to get, uh, it's going to be a very iterative process, so having the ability to remotely reset and remotely control the power on these sorts of boards is, is enormously useful. If your own activities are more confined to, I guess, more traditional hardware, PC hardware, that sort of thing, uh, these sorts of techniques can still be useful. Being able to remote power cycle um, equipment in a, a carlo is, a, is an obvious thing, but even if you're doing development yourself, it can just save you that. Uh, extra step of walking into the next room to reset a machine. If you're doing PC hardware though, this will, we've got some other techniques you can use to that sort of obviate the need for this direct hardware hardware support. So remote reset, remote power controller, I guess the two, hard, two hardware um, 
things that uh, we found very useful in the, in the lab to enable us to do this, bring up work very efficiently. Serial concentrators is basically a, uh, a rack mounted unit, the, one we, the particular one we've had experience with is uh, made by an Australian company called Open Gear. I don't get any commission but we've just used their kit and it works pretty well. But it essentially allows you to SSH to a serial port, a physical serial port, and in this case it has 48 of them. So we're able to connect to the serial consoles on the various embe on embedded boards of the entire lab, uh, quite a number of machines through one physical, physical box. Uh, Ethernet hubs and switches with a monitor, or Ethernet hub or switches with a monitoring port. One of the things you'll be striking again and again if you're doing the early bring up society things is dealing with uh, Ethernet devices that perhaps aren't working properly or uh, you're in the process of initialising them and then later on having to actually TFTP or otherwise or load firmware up to them. Ethernet hubs, although they're kind of out of fashion nowadays as, a, as the backbone for your network, uh, still have that unique um, characteristic that each port sees the traffic on all the other um, on all the other ports, making it, that being the main distinction between a hub and a switch. While that tends to be a nuisance on a congested network. Sorry, Julian, yes? Well, that, that's kind of what I was alluding to. If, if you've got an old hub th lurking around, don't throw it out because it, essentially it can be quite useful for this activity. More modern, many modern switches, though, it tends to be the more sophisticated ones that have um, inbuilt, cons uh, in inbuilt management will actually allow you to say, I want all the traffic that goes to port two to also be seen on port three or on a particular monitoring port. So that's sort of the, the tap kind of technique, I guess. Not all, sorry? Okay, sorry, my, my, my mistake. Yes, yeah, so mirroring seems to be fairly common, but only on the on switches that have got management. Whereas if you bought, you know, as I did, a cheaper switch for home, that won't necessarily give that ability. So having having a hub floating around is still quite a quite a useful thing. One of the things we observed with particularly with embedded boards was that um, often the onboard firmware. Uh, maybe a little bit immature or, or, or simple and one of the things we identified is if you have that sitting on a very busy ethernet uh, you can actually get a whole raft of problems there but with firmware locking up and these sorts of things so quite often if you're doing this sort of in, um, low level embedded work it's useful to actually have that hardware sitting on a physically se separate ethernet segment to everything else just so it doesn't see all the other all the other traffic hence the observation that some firmware has broken TFTP or DHCP support and sometimes it can behave badly when it's on a busy on a busy LAN. Uh, In-circuit debuggers um, are pretty unique to the uh, embedded society things, I guess, and are fairly specialised. But it's the sort of hardware if you have access to them can can uh, simplify that process of early bring up enormously. So move on to uh, early bring up some early bring up techniques. It's becoming increasingly common to use uh, simulation environment. Um, some of these are very, very sophisticated. Uh, at IBM, we were able to enjoy access to cycle accurate software based simulators so we could actually play with chips before they were physically instantiated in hardware at all. Um, for those of us working at home, though, or perhaps working on uh, Intel or other more common hardware, QMU and other free uh, emulators can be very, very useful as well because they'll, they'll give you, not, won't necessarily give you cycle accuracy, but they do give you an, an, an environment that, from a software standpoint, looks very much like the the real thing. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, uh, Sonny Rao, will be giving a talk tomorrow afternoon on bare, uh, adventures around bare metal Linux, which I, I commend to you. But a lot of what Sonny's actually going to be talking about is this next bullet point, which is um, the fact that new hardware can have some interesting features. Um, sometimes memory controllers don't work and those sorts of things, for example. So our team at various points had to deal with chips that didn't have fully functioning memory controllers and other, and they were able to employ various techniques to, for instance, load a kernel directly into cache and execute directly out of cache rather than out of main memory. The sort of thing that uh, became handy there, I believe this, this code's now uh, in mainline, is often if you're dealing with hardware that's either in a simulation environment or doesn't have access to working I.O. hardware, uh, it can be useful to use to run a console in memory rather than actually through a physical port. So in this particular case, the, uh, the, the console information is written to a particular area of physical, uh, particular physical memory address region. You actually interact with the, with the upcoming kernel through that. Device numbering uh, is a bit of a knotty, a knotty topic. Um, what we found c pretty consistently with embedded hardware is that different chip, the, the chips will consider 
uh, an Ethernet port to be called, say, EMAC2 and EMAC3. This is in the example of the, the 440 parts, for example. Linux in turn is going to label that ETH0 and ETH1. And I was tremendously embarrassed that um, through a mixture of sort of being half asleep and, and some strange PCB numbering that I was trying to debug a problem with Ethernet and I watched, wasn't actually physically plugged into that port at all. So that's another one to, to watch out for. In the kernel running, this is, this is pretty, speci uh, it's pretty specific, I guess, to working on, um, again, working on embedded hardware. But if uh, you're ever of a mind to get into repurposing uh, routers and things like that, devices that can run Linux but don't presently, some of these, um, th these supports could, could well be, be useful to you there. Most of the, the commonly supported architectures have a fairly standard bootloader process. Um, U-boot is a very common one in the PowerPC side of things. Um, if you're working with Intel chips, you're almost invariably going to be dealing with a fairly standard sort of BIOS environment. That's not to say that you, the kernel is necessarily reliant on that, and particularly on the PowerPC side of things, the kernel can actually uh, boot pretty much from scratch, by, by which we mean either using a uh, JTAG or some sort of other in-circuit emulation technique to actually physically to move the kernel image physically into memory and then just pointing the program counter and having it run from there. So you don't necessarily need a bootloader in order to actually boot or get the kernel, kernel running. There's some further gotchas. With that though, um, quite often the onboard firmware, whether it be on power or any uh, sort of embedded hardware, the firmware will actually often initialise serial ports itself, but then Linux will come along and reinitialise those and we've got caught out a number of times where things seem to be working getting a whole bunch of boot messages from the firmware, then as soon as the firmware calls the kernel, everything stops. And actually, the kernel was quite happily running, but the kernel had done some serial port reinitialization and console was being directed out to, to, other point, um, to another physical port that wasn't, wasn't tapped out on that particular board. Um, I spent half an hour one morning trying to work out why I wasn't getting debug messages from a kernel, because I hadn't um, put debug on the command line. So a, tra a trap for young players there. So moving away from uh, embedded hardware and so the low level side of things, just to talk a bit about some tools that, um, that we're using in the lab. Git's obviously the pretty much a tool of choice now for manipulating kernel uh, source trees. I don't propose to give a, a detailed Git tutorial here, but um, there are a number out there on the, on the web um, getting kernel, getting current trees and generally manipula manipulating source trees. Gets, so has its own ways of dealing with that, but I commend Matt McCall's catch-up utilities too as well. They're quite a nice way to I interact with Git and conventional tar tarball-based um, source trees. First, first little thing I wanted to demo, again, just to provide some examples and then sort of um, play with it or go, go from there, is a tool, tool called GitK, which is actually written by uh, one of my colleagues, Paul McCarris. and just hopefully successfully switch terminals. So Git, Git K is basically a tool that allows you to do some visualisation of um, Git commits. Down on the side here, on the, uh, the left-hand side of the screen, you can see what the, the beginnings of a directed acyclic graph, which basically if you used to follow it all the way down, you can actually see a, um, a visual representation of where the different merges and commits lead. Running through Git K would be a, almost an entire session itself. So I'll just do some quick, so obvious things. One of the devices, I recently did a, a very minor change to the kernel just to update the credits file, for example. And if we type that in, it'll go ahead and search and it'll pull out the first, rep, first match um, for my name. Not rocket science, but if you prefer GUI tools, it can be quite a nice way to, way to operate. As you, you can, as you can see here, this is unfortunately a, a, a relatively low risk screen I'm working on in front of me, but there's information about the, um, the different commits and a whole bunch of information made available to you there in a, in a visual, sort of a, visual sort of form. Another tool that was pointed out to me literally on the bus on the first day of the conference is one called TIG, or Git backwards. Um, Andrew, and I'm embarrassed I've forgotten his surname, talked about at great length, much of which went over me, but it's, ba it's very similar to GitK conceptually, but it's more of a text-based sort of tool. But again, it allows you that same sort of thing of being able to visualise visualize commits, uh, look at histories. Um, if I can type one-handed. No match. <laughs> I should point out, you'll notice down the bottom right, it's... Um, 
incrementing up. I'm actually running this on a Dell Mini 9, which is a really nice machine. Its electrical power is very low, so is its performance, relatively speaking. So please don't so infer that these tools are horribly inefficient. It's just a very modest process that it's being run on. So we may not even worry about letting that complete. No, it's the commit I'm looking for is further down that search. We won't, we shan't wait for it. But um, yeah, so I said TIG is, a, is another tool that's worth having a look at if you if you want to look, look at other uh, other tools now. We've got up to. Right. So a couple more things with um, with Git and um, Git bisect seem is because is becoming better known, I guess, but one of the things that our team spent a lot of time doing working on the PowerPC side of the kernel as we did was to, um, obviously finding bugs and correcting bugs, none of them the ones we made ourselves, of course, but those of others. Git bisect is quite a nice um, tool. Basically what it lets you do is do binary binary searches through the, the kernel tree. So you, you give a uh, tool, tool get you want to start a bisection process, give it a good and a bad uh, commit reference, build a resulting kernel, then once, depending on whether that, that kernel exhibits the bug or not, you can either say git bisect good, git bisect bad, and repeat that process. And what that allows you to do is, sorry, please. Uh, there's the, you're telling the bisect process that that particular kernel was good. So next time you, next time you do a, um, uh, a bisect, it will, it'll find another midway midway point on the right, so whatever you decide is the right or right. I'm sorry? Yeah, it, beg your pardon, yes, indeed, indeed it does. So the, the git, git bisect good at that point will then it give you a new, a new, or take the tree to another reference point depending on whether it was good, good or, good or, yep. Um, what you can do with that is a, so do a binary, binary tree search through the kernel and very quickly arrive at the point where you find the find the problem in question, the last command there uh, resets the process. The thing that's significant with this is it can be very, it can be, uh, very readily automated and we actually got to the point where we could do quite a lot of our um, PowerPC kernel architecture tests pretty much fully automatically by automating the build process, um, giving it some, some start and end points and we actually build a kernel, run it out to a piece of hardware, see if the fault was exhibited or not. And, um, Layered and narrow, pretty quickly narrowed down to a, a very small range of patches or commits that um, that caused the problem. Unfortunately, it's a long time since I've personally done kernel hacking. I guess it's three or four months now, if not uh, if not more. Um, Quilt was a tool that was in very wide or very common use um, in the lab. It, it's got a, a fairly modest uh, learning curve, and in, de in trying to do a tutorial would pretty much be a whole session in itself. But Quilt essentially allows, helps you automate that process of keeping kernel trees and keeping keeping your changes patches. And again, looking to looking at the way uh, my colleagues tended to work, that this idea of co or concept of keeping your work as patches rather than com as complete trees was a fairly pretty much a universal way of operating for the guys on the team. So uh, the combination of Quilt, Git, and keeping your works as patches basically made that process of tracking a mainline kernel much, much easier. So rather than having sort of your tree and, and mainline and continually having to do diffs and, and work backwards and forwards between them, if you implicitly kept your work as patches when mainline was updated, it was much easier, a much easier process to update your tree, incorporate your patches and, and go from there. One of my first memories of seeing um, Rusty Russell at work was the, um, the great ease with which he seemed to jump around the the kernel tree. Uh, a certain amount of that is, is undoubtedly Rusty being quite a quite a clever chap. But um, he had another tool in his arsenal, which um, quickly, uh, I quickly sort of added to mine. There's an op option within the kernel to build uh, tags files. Tags files allow um, your favourite editor, Emacs or Vi, as it might be, to have a concept of where functions and other particular keywords are within the kernel. So, for example. I've, um, I've started Emacs up on here because it takes me about 15 minutes otherwise. But if I wanted to look at where the um, key span initialization function, key span makes some serial to a uh, USB to serial adapters that I did some drivers for a long time ago. It asks me what tags file I want to visit. And it's called tags all count by default. It's big. It's going to take a, a moment to think about that. 
that da 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 no, didn't need to sing. Jumps you straight to the function. Okay, so that's sort of handy, but I'm interested in what's in this USB serial register function. Again, I can just do a meta full stop. It's picked up down the bottom there, it's picked up that I've got it, or the cursor is actually actually sitting on a particular function. It'll go off and find that. And you can basically jump around the kernel much, 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 much more quickly than you would otherwise, and you don't necessarily need to have the, have the whole uh, kernel headers and the layout of the kernel um, stuck in or in the back of your mind. Again, we can do another search, and it's just basically a quick way to, to jump around the, um, the kernel source. It works on functions, it works on prototypes, um, on type definitions, structures, uh, so on and so forth. And there's, there's also some um, similar tools, I've not used them myself, but uh, there's some similar tools there now for um, integrating that same C tags kind of functionality into GUI, so you can kind of get that same Eclipse-like um, sort of um, integration. Another tool that get, got a lot of use uh, back in the office is um, one called Dirtif, which is actually written by, uh, by one of our colleagues. And what I've got uh, for the sake of this example is a, is a current upstream tree and an older 2.6.20.24 tree. If we run, run Dirtif on that, Dirtif's in Debian and most, uh, most common patches, it'll actually go through and do a, do a visual diff of all the, um, all the files that have changed between those two two versions. We can look in um, oh, Sequoia board, why not? If I can drive a mouse. And basically gives you a visual representation of what's changed between those two files. You can actually then, if you so wish, select lines that you want to want to update one file from the other. It just provides a, a nice visual interface for doing doing quick cha quickly visualizing changes and moving ca um, those changes backwards and backwards and forwards. I'll talk a little bit about building kernels. Um, building kernels is something we did quite a lot of uh, in Auslabs and continue to the, to to this day. Um, I guess the general point here is though, is if you're particularly if you're working on kernel or equally if you're working on X or Open Office or anything like that, you're going to be re rebuilding it quite a bit. So you want to you probably want to try and make it as quick as possible. Um, the I guess approach vendors would like you to take is buy a honking big compile box. Um, I still quite like IBM, so I quite happily re recommend the uh, P595. That's a 64-way power six. It can build about three kernels per second, so you don't really have to wait for that that puppy too much. Unfortunately, we didn't actually have one in the lab. We were sort of we had similar hardware, but not quite that quick. So, like um, for those of us that have like me, have much more modest budgets. There's three tools I just wanted to talk about uh, real quick. Ccache is um, a nice little bit of code. The app get install Ccache, or just grab it straight out of your favourite um, out of your favourite distro. But essentially, what Ccache does is inserts itself um, or replaces your com the compilers and make and a few other tools on your system with it. And when you do a compile, Ccache looks at the arguments and basically caches the caches the results. It looks at, it uses a mixture of um, checksumming and date stamps and so forth to assess whether a file needs to be rebuilt, but essentially what it amounts to is it's a bit like a web cache but for object files. So if you try and compile something you've already compiled, it'll actually just return that object file out of cache directly directly, rather than going through the process of um, uh, recompiling things. Now that... <laughs> Go ahead, Julian, please. Okay. Well, by, yeah, true. But yeah, buying faster disk will certainly help. But CK will catch a lot of stuff that, that a make, make won't necessarily correctly correctly deal with. But it's it's a, one of the things I, I guess I liked about CK is it's one of those ones where you can pretty much just install it and forget, and you get the speed ups more or less for for free. This CC was. Um, the next stop along the way, uh, DISCC, as the name suggests, does distributed C compiles. Again, that's one of the things that's nice about it is it's pretty easy to set up. It, it does rely on you having, um, the, if you're doing cross-compilation, for example, you need to have the relevant cross-compilers installed on the other boxes in the farm. But it's a very easy and easily easy to set up um, distri distributed compile um, environment. While it, doing distributed compiles may sound a little bit exotic, I think it's fair to say that most of us do have more than one machine uh, at home, my daughter's uh, system quite often gets pressed into service, and she's blissfully unaware of it. In order to help me compile up kernels, as does our, our main server. So, one of but one of its real strengths is it's very easy to get going. 
Last but no, no means least is sea control, which is, I guess, a, 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 a wrapper, a GUI wrapper or GUI um, environment that lets you sort of control and monitor both the, the operation of both of those. They're all pretty easy to get going and uh, I would, I'd certainly commend them to you. Just a few other um, sort of random data points, I guess, uh, on the buildings, building kernels, the side of things. Um, this one will be obvious to anyone who's done sort of kernel work for any length of time, but it was a, an eye-opener for me the first time I was told about it, just basically being able to put all the binary stuff for the kernel somewhere else so you don't clutter up your, clutter up your trees. There's a few other tips there. These are the slides, so this will be, uh, be made available, but essentially just different ways of um, improving or, or uh, speeding up the process. So you know, moving to, now moving to some, I guess, random data points, just some general uh, tools that have found, um, found useful. The first few are, are a couple called iPrint and, um, and Bitfield. The iPrint, uh, we can change consoles. So I is not exactly complicated. Um, it won't change the world, but it does save you having to keep an ASCII conversion table sitting on uh, sitting on your desk. But basically, you can feed it any any uh, combination of, bit of um, bits, hexadecimal, ASCII, etc., and it'll just give you a, a representation back. A bit more useful though is another utility called Bitfield, written uh, by. Sorry. I'm sorry. Thank, thanks, Rusty. Is that what you had in mind? <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm going to be thinking about that for the rest of the evening now. <laughs> um, right, Bitfield is um, Bitfield's another nice little utility that the, use, the guys use a lot in lab, um, written by Jeremy Kerr and with some help from Michael Newling. Basically what it does is allows you to feed a, um, a register definition, in this case it's the PowerPC uh, main status register and a hexadecimal string to say what, um, what its current status is and it breaks that out so you can actually see what the different, um, uh, what the different bits mean. It's kind of handy if you're in that situation where you're dealing with a crash dump in one screen and have a working console on some other machine, you can actually see what's, uh, what's gone on. Uh, if, I, if my memory serves me correctly, dash L. So on Bitfield dash L, it will tell you what uh, what registers it knows about. It's pretty power PC centric at the moment, but um, I spoke with uh, Mark Gross from Intel, and there's, he was considering working out taking their um, the definition files they use to the various Intel chips and adding support for that. It's all extensible. There's a, a system wide file you can use to add your own extensions to Bitfield to add support for the for your favourite um, favourite chip. So, so the question is, um, what's the what's the package for Debian? It's not actually in uh, installed, but if you do a Google search on Bitfield and Jeremy, that will that's, that will take you to Jeremy's website, and you can find it from from digging around through there. There's a uh, um, there's a Debian, Debian packages available uh, for it. Right, bash stuff. Okay. So um. Sorry, fumble fingers. Just some other little um, some tips. This time, uh, to just bash, um, bash related. Well, I guess one, bash, as you as you may or may not be aware, has um, tab completion um, as, as a fairly standard feature now. If you're looking at Cetra uh, tab complete, uh, Cetra bash tab completion, there's a or there's a file there that actually get, has all system wide definitions. But what it essentially lets you do is things like say app get search foo. that's not going to work Thanks. and on a faster computer it would be done before it was beer time um, I'm driving this wrong I'm sorry it doesn't know I'm, I'm install. but basically it, it will let you So there, there it's gone ahead and queried the, the um, apt database and given me a match for all the, possi all the possible completions so app get install tux, which we won't worry about doing in this instance. Um, the bash completion also knows about how to, how to deal with make files, so 
in this um, directory, I've got a, a trivial, trivial program. If I can type make, and it'll go ahead and give me the different options that are available, or what make can basically do with the, with the make file in the current directory. That can be particularly useful on the kernel side of things too, because the kernel's got a pretty, pretty uh, rich or com complicated make file, and it will let you um, let you do a similar sort of thing. Favourite of mine, though, is if you, um, which I suspect I'm not going to be able to demonstrate. So the network, the um, demo gods are working against me rather badly by the looks. So I haven't got network access here at the moment for some reason, but uh, that same uh, bash tab completion will actually work with SCP. So if you're in a situation where you have your um, public key set up on the remote box, you can actually do SCP file name and then a remote host and it will actually go out to the network and give you um, directory completion off the, off the remote machine. Um, but I'm blowed if I know why my network is not working. Inside tables as well, which is um, which is handy. And the, the final point there is a pretty straightforward one. But if you're using rsync or something else that's got about a million different options and very long command parameters, and you get to the end of it and realise you've got to change your mind, go back to the start, put a hash in front of it, hit enter, and it'll still be in your, in your history, even though you won't have actually executed it. Uh, FGIPS. GIPS is another nice one. Basically, it's um, one of these utilities that may not change the world. I have a slightly Disorganised um, photo collection. FDUPS is basically a, a program that let, that's, uh, finds and reports duplicate files, and it's pretty canny about it. it does um, initially it does matching on the basis of file names, um, but it also does MD5 sums over the files, so it will actually catch catch duplicates where in the situation where the file name is changed. So if we run FDUPS dash R for a curse on the current directory, it will go ahead and tell me that there's various there's various cases where I've actually got the same the same file now in two two directories. It's really useful. I find it very useful for keeping your photo directory in order, but it's also a sort of tool that, with careful use, you can use it to help tame your, your um, source code trees to see whether files really have changed. And of course, in combination with Xargs, you can start automating things. So if you actually want to remove duplicates, you can pipe it through Xargs and actually remove things automatically. Of course, if you get it wrong, you can also remove your entire home directory. So there is a um, reason for a degree of caution uh, with that. The, um, so SSH, um, I was hoping to demonstrate some of these, but in the absence of um, a network, I'm going to be a little bit stuck, so we shall just press on. Uh, SSH is a tool that I guess we pretty much all know and love and use it quite a lot, uh, quite extensively. Um, the demonstration I was hoping to do was to log into a machine at home and run an X11 VNC session over it, but the um, domain the reason I'm going to call SSH out separately in the first instance is just to make, remind people that modern SSH, uh, since about version 2.1, 2.2 onwards I think, uh, has pretty extensive tools in terms of actually setting up the, um, a remote uh, mental block. Um, doing it not just forwarding by, by a port, but you can actually do entire sort of VPN style uh, port forwarding with, S with modern SSH. LSOF, uh, another, another useful tool, um, everything from pointing LSOF at your audio device to work out why you're not getting sound output, um, running it to look at what network sockets are open on your machine to see if something's happening which it shouldn't, or uh, otherwise debug, debug networking problems. X11 VNC was the one I really wanted to demonstrate, but I don't think it's going to happen, so we'll press on without. X11 VNC, um, you'd all be familiar, I imagine, with VNC, the ability to run remote desktops. What's, in, what's nice about X11 VNC is properly set up and assuming you have appropriate access to a remote machine, you can actually attach um, a VNC session to an existing X11 session. When I did this um, presentation in, in Ottawa earlier in the year, I had the classic um, domestic sort of tech support question from my sister that Thunderbird was no longer working, I really need my email. What can you do about it? And of course, I'm on a plane, so not terribly, terribly much at the time. But using X11 VNC, what I was actually able to do is arrange for her to leave her system on, log into it remotely. And because the problem she was having was a, if you like, a GUI-related one, setting, changing some settings in a, um, 
you know, GUI application that really the only way I was going to be able to debug it remotely was in, was being able to do that. The X11 VNC web page has in the main man page basically all the, all you need recipe wise in order to to do that. And assume you can have, you can get SSH access to the remote machine, you can go in go right in there and uh, debug it. I just apologise, I can't. I was going to demonstrate it on my daughter's machine, but in the absence of network, that's not going to not going to work. Screen is. Uh, I guess the text equivalent of X11 VNC in many ways in that it's, but um, it goes a little further than that. Screen essentially allows you to log into a remote machine, run it, and leave a number of t um, TDY sessions running and then log out. That can be useful for, um, uh, sorry? Sh shared attached. Two users, that need, you can do two users and so forth at the same time. Um, you can use it in a multi it's really good over slow and unreliable links into you can log into a remote machine, run screen and work in that sort of environment. If you inadvertently get disconnected, whatever you're working on will continue to run in your absence and you can log back into that and get uh, get access uh, get access to it. That can be as, as I said there in the slides, can be very good for over slow and unreliable links. But um another another suggestion that was made was that can be really good for doing um, builds on embedded systems or otherwise systems that run very, very slowly. Um, quite often the build, the build files and the make files themselves aren't set up to cope terribly well with you disconnecting. So if you run them in a screen session, you can kind of leave them running and, and go off and do something else or disconnect and let it run over, run overnight. Uh, Kevin Pulo is running a talk on uh, LD preload hacks tomorrow. Um, I won't. So uh, elaborate beyond there other than to say it's certainly particularly um, when, when triggers around so LD preload seems to get quite a workout. We use it for everything for getting around annoying proprietary software tendencies to uh, TiVo hacking back in the day, all sorts of different things. So I'd uh, commend Kevin's talk to you if you're not able to get to it. It's, um, it's certainly a, a technique that's worth learning. Essentially in brief what LD preload allows you to do is write your own function to intercept normal function calls on the system. So if you want to capture all the opens on a running application, it gives you a means to be able to do that. That's the thing. Some useful code snippets. Um, Tridge's junk code directory is uh, pretty cool. Um, always worth a, worth a bit of a look. And um, Rusty kicked off a project called CCAN, which is essentially intended to be to see what uh, CPAN is to Perl. Still in its early stages, but if you're looking for that little bit of code for do something. There's a couple of a uh, couple of resources there to take a look at. Just to wrap up, um, some random quotes. As I said, I just solicited these from a few different people. Paul's is one's first, but while well, I said it a little bit tongue in cheek, his his real point was um, as a as a developer community, don't assume people won't help you. Uh, indeed, his point was really trying try to assume the other way around, particularly within the kernel community, people are always happy to help. So please ask a question. Uh, I shan't read triggers out, but um, there's a good point there, dealing with files in particular in this case, but um, as this is a general programming uh, programming idiom, consider whether you really need to test things or whether you can just rely on the, uh, on the results of the, of the function you're calling. And um, the final one is provided by Greg Crowe-Hartman with, uh, with his permission, needs no further, further observation. That's all I had prepared. I'm happy to field questions. Wow, that was quick. Please. Yep. You can run NX on that. Ah, oh, good point. Okay. Yeah. No, that's thank, thank you for that. I'll, I'll play with that and add it into the into the mix. Uh, any other questions or suggestions? All right. Well, I'm sorry I wasn't able to demonstrate the network. Oh, so I beg your pardon. Please. No, I don't. Okay, so the, the um, comment was, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it, is it, it, was it ACK, did you say? ACK? Yeah, ACK, so rep, a replacement for grep that's source code aware, so I won't traverse into dot .cvs directories and do those sorts of things. Thanks, thanks for that. 
Any others, questions, suggestions? Right, well, thank you again for your attention and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.